It's the deadliest ship on the seven seas, especially if you're serving aboard. Well, pretty much only if you're serving aboard it. It's the Admiral Kuznetsov, and it's the absolute worst ship to ever sail under the Russian flag. Admiral Flota Sovietskova Soyuza Kuznetsov, or in English, ship which barely works, was designed during the late Cold War. The Soviet Union had a historical disadvantage when it came to naval warfare, largely spurred on by its lack of access to warm water ports. This makes fielding a large maritime force difficult. But Russia's immediate proximity to large European powers also means that throughout its history, its army has been prioritized over all other services. Yet navies allow one to project power globally, and without one, it doesn't matter how big your army or air force is, you'll only ever be a regional power. Without a navy, you can't hold enemy economic interests at threat, unless they are a landlocked power, and resupplying your own troops becomes difficult. Protecting your own economic interests is also practically impossible, especially if you're heavily dependent on sea trade. This is the driving force behind China's massive naval buildup in the Pacific. The Soviet Union didn't completely axe its navy, but it knew that it couldn't compete with NATO or mainly the US Navy. America has historically been the opposite of Russia. With two big oceans on either coast, the US has by necessity been a naval power. By the early 20th century, the US Navy was muscling in on the Royal Navy in terms of tonnage and capability. By the end of the Second World War, the US Navy reigned supreme and would remain that way until China would rise to threaten it. And even then, China only presents a regional threat to the US Navy, not a global one. In the Cold War, the Soviet Union had two maritime goals in case of a war. First, to delay and disrupt US shipping to Europe, and the second, to defend its own shores and keep the US Navy from joining the fight. With a naval air force larger than most national air forces, the Soviet Union was in effect facing two American air forces. To achieve the first goal, the Soviets had to break the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, a stretch of ocean that runs between the three countries. Getting a surface action group past this defensive line was a dicey proposition at best, if not completely impossible outside of World War III historical fantasy books. However, the Soviets did have the capability of launching an amphibious assault against Iceland, linchpin of the Atlantic defensive line, albeit only if it could take NATO by surprise and move swiftly. Breaking the Atlantic line was vital for the Soviets keeping US firepower out of Europe. With a wall of NATO nations between it and the ports used to offload American troops and equipment in Europe, the Soviets could only hope to interdict American shipping across the Atlantic trade routes, much like the Germans attempted to do. Exactly like the Germans, the Soviets relied primarily on submarines to accomplish this task and fielded a very large and capable submarine force for just a task. This left the Soviet surface fleet with the mission of defending Eastern Bloc shorelines from the US Navy, a role they would be far more survivable in. Operating close to shore in a fortress fleet doctrine, Soviet ships enjoyed the protection of shore-based air defenses and anti-ship missiles. However, the Soviets still wanted the capability to project power far from home in low-intensity conflicts, where they wouldn't have to face far more sophisticated naval forces. And there was the prestige of owning aircraft carriers, America's crown jewel. Thus, the Admiral Kuznetsov class was designed from the ground up for a fundamentally different role than that of the American carrier fleet. Until the Kuznetsov class, the Soviets never had true aircraft carriers, instead operating cruisers that could house small air wings. At first, this was only a small helicopter complement to aid in scouting and anti-submarine warfare. But in the 1970s, the Soviets laid down the Kiev class, a hybrid cruiser and fixed-wing aircraft carrier. Originally, the Soviet Admiralty wanted to develop a comparable supercarrier to the American Kitty Hawk class. However, budget realities soon set in and the survivability of these massive platforms against the might of the US Navy was put into question. Thus, a compromise was reached, resulting in what the Soviets would call a heavy aviation cruiser. This fancy bit of wordplay, which should be familiar to Japanese audiences, was actually a pretty fair description, but also necessary so that the Soviet Kiev class could exit the Turkish Straits. Under the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits, Warships transiting the Turkish Straits between the Mediterranean and Black Sea were limited to a certain size, tonnage, and weaponry. Aircraft carriers over 15,000 tons were forbidden from crossing the Straits. And this was a problem for the Soviet Union, as it built all of its aircraft carrying cruisers in present-day Ukraine. While aircraft carriers over 15,000 tons were forbidden from crossing, aircraft carrying warships were not. As at the signing of the treaty, many battleships carried a small complement of aircraft for spotting fire and reconnaissance. Thus, the Soviets simply called their ships aircraft-carrying cruisers. 
and all was well, despite the complement of up to 12 Yak-38 VTOL aircraft. To be fair, the Kiev class was also packing significant firepower aside from its aircraft. Its foredeck was littered with air defense and surface attack missiles, as well as 10 torpedo tubes. The ships could pack P-500 anti-ship missiles, up to 8 in total, and sporting a fearsome 2,200-pound warhead or alternatively a 350 kiloton nuclear warhead. Flying at Mach 3, these missiles haunted the dreams of US sailors and were surprisingly sophisticated for the time. Fired in salvos, the missiles would fly at wave top height, with one missile flying at higher elevation and using its radar to feed targeting data to the other missiles. If that missile was destroyed, another missile would automatically take its place. Upon reaching the final phase of their flight, all of the missiles would pop up and turn on their radars, with half the salvo homing in on big US carriers and the rest on its escort ships. Only three of the Kiev class would be built, with one becoming a Chinese luxury hotel in 2014, another turned into a naval museum in 2016, and the third broken up and sold for scrap. A subclass of the ships known as the Baku subclass would result in one ship, the Admiral Gorshkov. This ship would be sold to India in 2004, refurbished and continues to be in service with the Indian Navy as the INS Vikramaditya. And this is where we get at last the Admiral Kuznetsov class, and the ship which would be the flagship of the entire class, named, well, Admiral Kuznetsov. Planned to be a two-ship fleet, only one was built thanks to the end of the Cold War and the Russian economy tanking. It might be smaller than a supercarrier, but it still packs a formidable punch and is well worth the title of aircraft carrying heavy cruiser. Its primary armament is the Sukhoi Su-33, the carrier variant of the Su-27. Developed to replace the VTOL-capable Yak-38, the Su-33 featured an upgrade in range and payload, which forced the Soviet Union to ditch the VTOL concept entirely and build the larger Kuznetsov-class ships in the first place. It only carries a fraction of the aircraft of a US carrier, but with 18 Su-33s on board, it's still a formidable weapon against lower-tier regional naval powers. However, the Kuznetsov isn't large enough to field an AWACS platform, which is where the six-ship flight of MiG-29Ks come into play. Theoretically, the MiG-29s would have been able to network together with other aircraft and provide an airborne early warning and air control system, but that capability never truly materialized. Instead, the six MiG-29s were part of an incomplete order which was meant to replace the entire Su-33 complement aboard the Kuznetsov. This leaves the Kuznetsov with a glaring vulnerability, as a surface action group without AWACS in the sky is just begging to be sent to the bottom of the sea. This is why aircraft carriers are so critical to modern blue water naval operations, and why despite having more holes in the water, China remains unable to challenge the US far from its own shores. For a ship designed to fight close to home though, this isn't a big vulnerability but it does mean that the Kuznetsov is basically a liability in any conflict that doesn't take place under cover of shore-based air defenses or against a relatively unsophisticated foe. However, the Kuznetsov packs one hell of a punch with its 12 granite anti-ship missiles. These supersonic missiles pack a 1,600-pound warhead that can sniff out American carriers at a range of 388 miles. The missiles are so physically large and move so fast that even a direct hit from a Sea Whiz system isn't guaranteed to stop the carnage as the supersonic wreck of the missile slams into a ship's structure with deadly kinetic energy. Considering the US fleet was and still is largely fielding anti-ship missiles with a third of the explosives, the granite continues to give sailors headaches to this day. But the Kuznetsov was almost never a part of the Soviet fleet at all. The ship was laid down in 1982 at the Nikolaev South shipyard inside of Ukraine. When Ukraine and the Soviets went on the splits, Ukrainian President Leonid Kravchuk sent a telegram to the ship's commander politely informing him that his aircraft carrier now belonged to an independent Ukraine. The captain was promptly ordered to sail to Vidyagevo before the Ukrainians could get their hands on it, ensuring it would have every opportunity to waste billions of Russian rubles in the years to come. In 1995, the Kuznetsov had its first deployment, and immediately the warning signs of what would be called Russia's cursed ship were on full display. From December 23, 1995 to March 22, 1996, the Kuznetsov and its escorts underwent a familiarization deployment into the Mediterranean, from whose warm waters the ship could operate nearly around the clock. The ship ran flight operations from early morning until 9 p.m. each day, flying aircraft close enough to the Israeli coast that the nation scrambled F-16s to escort the Russian fighters. Everything went well enough until the ship's evaporators began to break down. Responsible for creating drinking water for the crew by distilling seawater, the breakdown caused a severe water shortage amongst the crew. Sent for repairs, the ship would suffer the fate of much of the Russian Navy 
As major financial problems caused severe cutbacks in the defense budget, the ship's fate was in effect as frozen as the Northern Fleet shipyard it lay moored in, with repairs being halted due to no funding being available. It wouldn't be until 1998 that the ship's overhaul was complete and she was cleared for service once more. However, aircraft carriers or aircraft carrying heavy cruisers aren't cheap to operate. The US spends $1.5 million a day per aircraft carrier in operational costs. Thus, the Kuznetsov was stuck in port for a further two years, finally cleared for deployment in the Mediterranean in 2000. However, the sinking of the Kursk, a Russian-powered nuclear submarine, canceled any plans for deployment. Famously caused by a lack of maintenance and poor training, the sinking of the Kursk was an alarm bell for a long-neglected Russian fleet. In the wake of the tragedy, Russian admirals called for more funding, warning of future possible disasters. But budgets were tight, and the Russian Navy was a low priority. The Kuznetsov would assist in recovery of the Kursk before having future deployments once more cancelled. As the world would come to see, this was probably a good thing, as soon, serving aboard the Kuznetsov would be one of the deadliest jobs in the Russian Navy. In 2004, the carriers went out to sea for sea trials and inspection, showing worrying signs of poor maintenance. Nonetheless, she was cleared for operation, and in 2004 she partook in a large exercise in the Atlantic. In 2005, she would claim her first victim and highlight a crippling deficiency that would claim aircraft for over a decade to come. In 2005, the Kuznetsov was undergoing training in the North Atlantic when a Su-33 piloted by sub-colonel Yuri Korniv came in for a landing. According to the Russian government, the plane's brakes failed, causing it to skid along the runway and crash into the ocean. Luckily, the pilot was able to eject and was safely recovered. With the Russian government later dropping depth charges on the wreckage of the plane 3,000 meters below and then sending a submersible to ensure the plane was properly destroyed. However, soon sources came forward to counter the official government story. According to these sources, as the Su-33 came in for a landing, the arresting cable responsible for safely slowing the plane down broke. The Su-33 was thus sent sliding across the deck and over the edge. For a Russian government so focused on public perception, it would be easier to blame the airplane rather than one of the most fundamental systems of an aircraft carrier. However, whatever the truth is, further training flights were cancelled as the Kuznetsov once more sailed for home. In 2006, the Kuznetsov was slated to return to service after modernization efforts to correct fundamental issues with the ship's systems. But it wouldn't be until December 2007 that the Kuznetsov was once more sent on deployment. Here, the Kuznetsov would enter a sort of grace period, where everything largely worked as it should. However, a lack of proper maintenance by a cash-strapped Russia, determined to prove it was a legitimate naval power, would lead to disaster. In 2009, a short in a wire caused a fire which would kill one crew member. Later that year, the ship caused an international incident. On February 14, 2009, a European Maritime Safety Agency's Clean Sea Net satellite alerted to a detected oil spill just off the southern coast of Ireland. An Irish Air Corps patrol aircraft was dispatched, visually confirming the spill surrounding the Admiral Kuznetsov and its underway replenishment ships. Coincidentally, the Kuznetsov was undergoing refueling at the time, but the Russians immediately denied that anything had happened. The British, meanwhile, estimated about 300 tons of oil had been spilled. The Russians admitted culpability, though claimed only 20 to 30 tons of oil had been spilled, while either washing the ship's decks or pumping out the bilges. Consider those numbers. The Russians were apparently greasing their entire flight deck with oil an inch thick to cause a massive spill. Of course, it wasn't 20 to 30 tons, but rather 300 tons over an area 4 miles by 5 miles. Two days later, the Russians confirmed they'd been undergoing refueling when the spill happened but did not know how or why it had occurred. Given that the Kuznetsov was at this point being escorted by one tugboat in case it broke down, the cause of the spill was pretty obvious. Ten days later, the Russians would admit fault and claimed that human error and technical malfunction had been to blame, with what technical malfunction that was exactly remaining a mystery. In 2011, the Kuznetsov was sent to menace the world's oceans once more, in a deployment lasting until February, when it departed Syria for its home port, and promptly lost all propulsion. Despite a year of repairs after the oil spill incident, the Russian fleet had such little faith in the Kuznetsov that it once more had been deployed with an accompanying tugboat. That proved prudent, as the Nikolai Chikar would take the mighty Russian's fleet flagship in tow and slowly drag it back home. She would have one more successful deployment under her own power until she was once more deployed in 2016 off the coast of Syria to support Russian military operations, bombing civilians because military targets are too hard to accurately hit. Once more, she was accompanied by an ocean-going tug, 
which probably really filled her small surface action group with great confidence in the Russian flagship's ability to survive combat. The ship Su-33 had been fitted with bomb sites to allow the use of free-fall bombs with limited accuracy, allowing the carrier's planes to carry out ground attack missions inside Syria. By now, the Kuznetsov was famously belching out huge clouds of black smoke as she steamed along, and on October 21st she passed through the English Channel. The British Royal Navy dispatched two ships to escort the largest Russian naval deployment since the Cold War. On November 14, 2016, a MiG-29 took off from the carrier on a routine exercise, only to be put into a holding pattern when the crew realized that one of the arresting cables had once more broken. Rather than be diverted to a nearby airbase, the ship's captain ordered the pilot to stay in the air. Inevitably, the MiG-29 ran out of fuel and was forced to ditch into the sea, with the pilot being rescued via helicopter. The incident highlighted not just the gross incompetence of the ship's captain, which cost the Russian Navy an $11 million jet, but also the disrepair of the ship itself, as well as its greatest design flaw. Because the ship had basically been designed to be a carrier light, it utilized a ski ramp to aid planes in taking off. However, ski ramps severely limit the fuel and ordnance of a carrier aircraft, as well as the type of aircraft the ship can deploy. On a full-sized carrier or one with more powerful launch facilities or even planes with more powerful engines, the MiG-29 would have likely had enough fuel that when it became obvious the arresting cable wasn't being fixed, it could have still made for a friendly airfield. But that's just not the Russian way. And despite the arresting cable historically snapping in two, the captain ordered the plane to stay in the air until it ran out of fuel. The Kuznetsov continued combat operations with the Russians claiming major victories in airstrikes against Islamic State terror groups. Given that the ship was already suffering from a severe shortage of qualified pilots and the imprecision of Russian precision weapons, these claims remain dubious. However, on the 3rd of December, half a month after its first arresting gear failure, the Kuznetsov struck again, destroying another Su-33 as its arresting gear failed once more. The Su-33 slid straight into the drink and the pilot was forced to eject. At this point, the Kuznetsov had downed more Russian aviators and inflicted a greater financial cost to Russia than the Islamic State had, and it was decided that the rest of the air power on the ship would be transferred to airfields to continue combat operations. To what we can only imagine was the great relief of the entire crew. Field repairs were carried out until Russia ceased the involvement of the Kuznetsov's battle group in the region and dispatched it for home. Now safely in port at the 35th Ship Repair Plant in Murmansk, the Kuznetsov would lose its appetite for Russian planes and develop a new one for Russian lives. In what could only be described as a comedy of errors, the Kuznetsov took on the job of single-handedly destroying as much of the Russian defense budget as it possibly could. The ship needed serious repairs, but whether it was the vodka or completely unfounded Russian optimism, the Kuznetsov began a modernization program to extend its service life by 25 years. Huge combat ships are expected to have service lives that extend into the decades. After all, U.S. carriers can serve for half a century without major maintenance. But U.S. carriers also, generally, just work. The Kuznetsov did not only not work, it was fundamentally flawed with an aircraft arresting system that saw systemic breakdowns and also had no role in the modern cash-strapped Russian military. The Kuznetsov was a bad ship with no mission, but it was a prestige item for Vladimir Putin's Russia. So in typical Russian fashion, Russia doubled down on an absolutely terrible investment. Because sunk cost fallacy is apparently not taught there. The Kuznetsov needed serious upgrades to its superstructure, electronic components, arresting gear, crew facilities, engines… everything. The ship was moved to the PD-50 floating dock, one of the largest floating docks in the world. This was very much a case of Freddy meets Jason, as PD-50 had its own colorful history. It was built in 1978 for the Soviet Union by Sweden and at the time would be the world's largest floating dock. However, during sea trials, two of its ballast water tanks collapsed and threatened to sink the dock, prompting the Swedes to quickly tow it back to shore. Repairs were made and PD-50 was handed over to the Soviets. The Soviets took PD-50 in tow using two Dutch tugboats. However, after sailing past the Norwegian coast, PD-50 attempted to defect to NATO and made a break for freedom, breaking free of its tugs. Unfortunately, its quest for sweet, sweet capitalist freedom was ended when storm winds blew the dock ashore on the Soviet side of the Norwegian border. Damage to the dock was extensive but ultimately deemed repairable. Thus, the dock was shipped to a Norwegian shipyard where 4,000 tons of steel were used in its reconstruction. The accident-prone PD-50 would cross paths with Kuznetsov in 2018 when it had enough of living under Russian yoke and decided to permanently quit the chat, and it would try to take the Kuznetsov with it. PD-50 suddenly began to sink, 
causing the Kuznetsov to sink with it and one of the dock's 70-ton cranes to come smashing down onto the Kuznetsov's flight deck. The accident left a massive 200-square-foot hole that would cost 70 million rubles to fix. The crane itself would take until the end of 2018 to be removed, slowing down repair efforts even further. The Kuznetsov was at least floating, though, and repairs continued on board the ship. In late May 2019, it was decided that two dry docks would be merged to make room for the Kuznetsov and other large surface vessels of the Russian Navy, though this would take a year and a half of construction efforts. Out of dry dock, most of the necessary repairs and upgrades to the Kuznetsov could not be carried out, pushing its expected completion date back years. To make matters worse, the ship caught fire in December of 2019, killing two and injuring over a dozen. Damage to the ship was estimated at $8 million. In May 2022, though, the finish line was in sight and the ship was being prepared for removal from dry dock. That's when the world's most flammable ship went up in flames again, with Russian state news agencies claiming the fire was promptly put out and the ship's damage control system had done its job with no damage. The Kuznetsov would make its triumphant and murderous exit out of dry dock in February 2023. However, the ship is estimated to still need about a year of overhauls before it is combat-worthy once more. And combat-worthy is a term we're using about as loosely here as the Russian Navy. It'd be more accurate to say that it'll be about a year before the Kuznetsov is ready to return to the task of generally doing more to hurt the enemy than its own crew and the Russian budget. Generally, but not completely. Now go check out Analyzing Russia's Massive Failures in the War Against Ukraine, or check out this other video instead.